So I turn back to you. Okay, how would you define trafficking? Now, some of you have probably addressed this in your classes, or maybe know um, some background information from watching various news programs, etc. Um, so I'd love for you to, you know, maybe get, you know, and very briefly, and there's not a lot of room to move around. So just maybe talk with your neighbor about how you define trafficking, and more importantly, who's involved, what's involved, where does it happen, why does it happen, and how. And in particular, how, if we reflect back to Lily's ways, how is the recruiting happening? Because that's something that I'm most concerned about, and, and perhaps one of the ways that we, as, as citizens, can try to mitigate trafficking. So a little bit of who, what, when, where, why, and how. How about two minutes? And then we'll come back and share your thoughts. Okay? So, and you want to have a succinct, a succinct definition of human trafficking, and if not, that's okay. I'm more interested in hearing about issues of risk, strategy, etc. So, we were talking about social media. Do you want to say anything more about that? I don't want to put you on the spot. So. You were just saying that like it makes a big impact on like who's affected and like their age and how technology like plays a role. Okay. And we heard some really good ideas about who is a potential victim. Um, I was just saying that with human trafficking, you can find any victims, but also men can be victims of human trafficking. Absolutely. And similarly, often there's um, uh, an understanding that it is primarily men who are the traffickers, but women are the traffickers as well. Okay, any other thoughts? Thoughts about risk? Think about, <coughs> think about risk. Think about the fact that, you know, who's gone to a high school football game when you were in high school? Who's gone to a mall when you were a preteen or a teen, right? These are now prime recruiting grounds for trafficking of youth, particularly sex trafficking. And it's horrifying. As a mother, kids are here, so he's hiding. <laughs> um, as a mother, as a community member, as an as a, as a advocate and an activist, these things touch my heart really deeply. And so I want us all to try and work together to try and identify risk and help, you know, if, if there's any way to help somebody who we think might be a victim, just like we saw in Lily's wings. Okay, so um, the United Nations and various other international organizations, like the International Labor Organization, have come up with some really um, handy um, ways to look at how trafficking is really diverse. Um, but there are also um, ways that um, we can identify when things become problematic. So we have act, means, purpose. Act, recruitment, transportation, transfer, harbor, and receipt of persons. One myth is that it involves movement across international <laughs> borders. That's not necessarily the case. Um, it can happen in our own neighborhoods. Okay, means. So this is this idea of risk and how we can identify potential victims. Threat or use of force. So one um, person in the audience mentioned when um, it was Vic that grabbed Rhonda's arm, right? I mean, things went from very nice and lovely to really nasty very quickly. Coercion, abduction, fraud, deception. Think about, again, think about Vic. He loved Rhonda and wanted the best for her, wanted her to be beautiful, etc. But there were some deceptive motives underneath what he was saying. Abuse of power, abuse of vulnerability, giving payments or benefits, so that's kind of the strategy or the methodology, and the purpose. Overall, it's exploitation, overall, it's enslavement. Um, the prostitution of others, we'll talk about language, about sex work and prostitution. Exploitation of both of sexual exploitation, all kinds of bodily exploitation. Forced labor, slavery or similar practices. Removal of organs. Right? That's a whole subset of trafficking um, and other types of exploitation. So think about how diverse this is from sex trafficking to actually being drugged and having your kidneys taken out um, and then you're you know, sent on your merry way. It's horrifying. Okay? Um, some of the um, factors, right? So what 
you think is one of the most key factors for trafficking? Hello. Actually, my colleague Charlie <laughs> told me a line. She says that where there is a demand, there is a market. Where there's demand, there's market. Absolutely. And there's a lot of focus on demand. Um, and how to reduce demand or or help demand the demand also um, understand the risk of that demand. Okay, but for the victims, what would be a factor? Okay, let's think about the play. Right, the young woman um, wanted to get the steps fixed for grandpa. Right, so what does that involve? Sorry. A need, a financial need, right. Usually it's poverty, and often it's extreme poverty, and we're gonna talk about some various uh, transnational and international contexts as we move forward. Um, if anyone wants these slides, I'm happy, I'm happy to share them with you. Um, cl clearly above and um, foremost is poverty, um, but also issues of social exclusion, underemployment, unemployment, um, lack of educational opportunities, discrimination, gender inequality, the feminization of poverty. There are far more poor women around the world than poor men. Uh, political factors, political instability of a national or regional context, armed conflict, official corruption. So you get the, you know, if it's, if it's happening at the top levels of, of power, that's very hard to fight. Poor governance, yep, governance weakened rule of law, Global factors, certainly globalization, right? What's involved with globalization? So, increased ability to move about the world, to communicate, right? The transfer of money across borders is much more quick and efficient than it was in previous decades. Labor market liberalization, freedom of movement, as I just mentioned. The global economic crisis, which is celebrating its 10th year anniversary this fall. Um, the ramifications are still very much alive um, for many, many people around the world, including in this community. Market economy focused on profit making, right? So think about the intersections of capitalism and trafficking. Any other factors? Any other thoughts? Okay, right, so it's really about economic need and people exploiting other people's economic need. Okay, so I'm um, sorry about the, the formatting here. Another quick question for all of you. What do you think is the most common form of human trafficking? And uh, I use the term enslavement um, essentially um, concurrently with human trafficking. So what do you think it is? Anybody? Sex trafficking, okay, what else? Think about those various other subsets I mentioned, of organ, organ theft. Yes? Forced marriage. Pardon? Forced, Forced marriage, okay. That's a biggie, yes? Labor. Sorry? Labor. Labor, okay. Anybody else? Okay, bonded labor. Okay, bonded labor involves some kind of contractual agreement. It is nearly always informal, <coughs> thus unenforceable by law. It's very difficult to prove as well. And it involves someone being compelled to work to repay some kind of debt or some kind of service that a trafficker has provided. Often, if this involves transnational <coughs> borders, the traffic victim is left stranded, enslaved, passport, confiscated by the trafficker, unable to return to their homes and their families. Okay, so, um, there are two major subsets according to various legislative bodies from the United Nations to the U.S. federal government of labor trafficking and sex trafficking. So, bonded labor is a subset of labor trafficking that involves servitude, peonage, an antiquated term of, of um, um, it's usually agricultural labor, debt bondage, or slavery. And again, just when, remember when um, we saw that graphic with aims, uh, means, and um, motive, 
all the means, recruitment, obtaining, harbor transport, using force, fraud, or coercion. Okay, second subset, sex trafficking. Although um, I, I don't, um, I, I agree that most people assume that sex trafficking is one of the biggest um, kinds of human trafficking. It's probably, that's probably because there's so much attention to it. There's far less attention to something like bonded labor. Okay, sex trafficking, um, I have a lot of resources on the table in the hallway that give very specific definitions, legal <coughs> definitions from the United Nations, the U.S. government, other national governments, and the Costa Rican government. I don't want to take the time to go through them, but I'm happy to share all of that information with you. Um, right here, we have the Traf Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. It was amended in 2015. This is the current U.S. federal um, body of legislation for um, helping people to um, to overcome this, for people be, to be tried who are engaging in trafficking and so forth. Um, this was particularly compelling and devastating to me. I mean, these images are just are just horrifying. But the average cost of a person who has been enslaved by a trafficker is 90 bucks. Okay, so I want you to think about the potential for profit. Okay, and this is worldwide, right? So a trafficked person in the U.S. probably you know, costs more to um, a slave coercer. But 90 bucks, and let's see how much people can make off of this. So in the U.S., and I, I find the term pimp way too kind and gentle for what the, the controller or the coercer um, is doing, but that person can earn on average 15000 per month per enslaved person. Think about the money involved. And remember what Joe Beth Gonzalez said, that this is the second most profitable industry after drug trafficking. And um, so when we think about why does this happen, because people can make a lot of money from it. And unlike drugs, where you're actually selling a, pro a, a product that then goes away, a human being can be resold and resold and resold. It's absolutely horrifying. Okay, um, I want to tr um, make a quick transition to what I see are various literacies that people, both young and old, should be attentive to, to not only find and identify uh, persons at risk in their own community, but to help advocate worldwide. I start with financial literacy, right? So um, there was a there's a lot of stuff on TV these days. So I have a list outside of various um, episodes of, um, of um, law, law dramas, films, and also news reports. So an extended program that by Diane Sawyer a year and a half ago on trafficking notes that there are um, girls in this preteen and teen age range from 12 to 14, or a little bit younger, a little bit older, who are actually going online searching for, and they actually use the term sugar daddy or, or various other terms, to say, to, because they, they want stuff, right? And if we think about what people, young people want these days, a lot of expensive stuff, phones, expensive makeup, et cetera, et cetera, jewelry, right? I thought he would buy me nice things and that would be it, we would just be friends, right? So there's, there's an intense need for literacies that start with financial and continue with relational and risk. So the need to understand risk, okay? Um, so we all learn this thing in kindergarten and preschool, don't talk to strangers, right? And there are all kinds of you know cultural nuances about that, but you know, we talk to people all over the world with great ease with social media. Right? <laughs> and it's very easy to not be certain to whom we are, with whom we are communicating. So these are um, three, a set of three um, awareness raising posters um, from the, the U.S. federal government. Okay, but this is the one that, that um, I found most disturbing and most compelling. So if we think about those wings, right, that boyfriend, and he's doing this verb, boyfriending, to boyfriend how to be a boyfriend who is actually gaining the trust of a young woman or a young man, far more likely to be young women and girls than boys and young men, but it can, um, 
think it certainly can be inclusive. So what do you think is going on here? Okay. So usually a so-called pimp is probably not going to be young enough and cute enough to attract uh, a high school student or a junior high student, right? So who's put in place to do this? Someone like Vic, right? They're probably either forced into that role, there's some a really fantastic um, independent film out of Mexico that, that tracks a person who's been enforced to be a recruiter um, and how devastating it is for him. So there are many, many more victims than just um, the person who is boyfriended, right? Uh, but this, this is very effective, right? Because the boyfriend type, the recruiter, will be extremely nice and loving and give immense attention. There's um, a tremendous understanding of psychology um, to understand what someone wants and to purport to give that to them. There are survivors who have indicated that I never had a birthday cake, and and this boyfriend got me a birthday cake for my birthday, and it was really nice, right? So they know how to get into one's heart and then subsequently break one down. Okay, and. It's scary, right? Because it's really effective. Okay? The need for relational literacy extends beyond the cute boyfriend type in the mall or the football field or whatever um, to other types of relationships. In this case, um, in April 2017, there were two pastors in the Toledo area who were arrested for having <laughs> relation, sexual oppressive relations with a minor child. Um, and also um, um, jobbing out that person, um, pimping out that young minor. And this is one of the houses of the people, of the, of the pastors. Beautiful, right? Totally respectable. So people in positions of respect and community leadership are, are primed to have people trust them, extended family members, as well as the potential victim. Now, I'm not saying that all pastors are bad, right? This is an extreme case, okay? But um, anyone can really, you know, do some serious damage. So remember when I said a few minutes ago that this is very close to my heart, and it started at this moment. Um, in 2006, the Toledo Blade did um, a series of articles about teenage sex trafficking in the Toledo area. And um, at that point, the Blade reported that Toledo was a major recruitment hub in the entire country. Um, the statistics are very difficult to define, but the, the, it's been, Toledo's been rated as high as third in the nation after uh, cities like Los Angeles, New York, Miami, um, Chicago, New Orleans. That has changed, but at that point, fourth in the country. And I also learned from that series that within 48 or 72 hours of leaving home, one third of child runaways in the US are kidnapped and forced into commercial exploitation. Okay, my daughter Daniela was six years old at the time. She's in the corner, right? Scared the shite out of me, friends, okay? So what do you do if you're a parent with a beautiful six-year-old daughter how do you help that, that young person understand not to run away, right? What would you do, all right? I talked with Danielle and, and Xander, my son, and help them understand the dangers, right? But it's very difficult for a young person to understand this risk and this danger, right? And usually they're not thinking when they run away and then there, and when it says kidnapped, it may be in a very subtle manner, maybe in a boyfriending type of manner. Okay. So think about how, if you have younger brothers and sisters, children, how do you communicate these very important um, issues to a very young person? So keep thinking about that. Okay, um, I'm going to make a transition from our local context. Um, there's a Toledo sex trafficking arrest um, just this spring with a minor child, um, as well as um, this is the case of another pastor arrested um, 
for um, trafficking a homeless woman in Connecticut. Um, and it's important to know that often trafficked victims will be literally trafficked around the country. They won't stay in one place too long because that helps lessen the risk for the trafficker. Okay, so we're going to switch to an, an international context. A bit of water. So we're going to talk about Costa Rica. Who's been to Costa Rica? Yay. What do you think of it? It's pretty. It's pretty, yeah. Yeah, what else? Lots of cool nature. Nature, yeah. So we're attracted to this country for nature and beauty and environmental diversity. And it's a really phenomenal place. It's also relatively close and it's relatively affordable to get to from the US and so forth. Um, I had no idea um, the first time that my spouse, my name is Scott Martin, and I traveled to Costa Rica in 2011. Um, anything about sex work, decriminalized, criminalized, I have no idea. And learned from um, traveling there about their legislative model, which I would suggest is much better than in many places, including most places here in the US. So um, Costa Rica is a, um, a democratic nation. Um, it's known as the Switzerland of Central and South America because it's very uh, politically and economically stable compared to elsewhere in that region. And, um, and amongst other things, um, you know, free education, free health care. They do a lot of really good things. What did I just do? Hey, okay. Sorry about that. Um, and they um, have a decriminalized sex work uh, legislative model for persons over the age of 18. Because of that, Costa Rica, along with other uh, countries like the Dominican Republic and elsewhere in South America, have become a hub for what's called sex tourism, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so my question, which I'll show you again in, in one or two slides from now, um, is about what, what makes a place like Costa Rica different for people who choose to engage in sex work? And this is very different from someone who is forced into it, right? Okay. So, um, so let's look at some research questions, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Um, but first, uh, before research questions, I want to share with you some of my commitments as a researcher. Um, and this dates back to what um, Dr. Schiffer was saying about the work I've done in North Africa and the Middle East and elsewhere, um, Southeastern Europe, and here in Costa Rica. So as a feminist scholar, my goal is to try to do whatever I can to break down power hierarchies. And one of those power hierarchies is patriarchy. What is patriarchy? Anybody? familiar with that term? Okay, well, the, you know, a very simple definition would be um, the, the, the gender equality that far more often than not makes men much more of a powerful situation than women, and all the um, related um, factors that go into that, and, and economic justice is certainly one of them. Um, second, Human rights, safety, and dignity for all. Number three, um, related to number two, certainly, economic justice and workers' rights. Okay, so first research question guiding my study. Um, first, I want to make um, let it be known that this, this study is really complex in all kinds of ways. It's emotionally complex, it's legislatively complex, it's inter in an inter interdisciplinary way, it's very complex. Um, and it's also fraught with stuff that people get really uptight about, right? In terms of sex, the legalization or the decriminalization of sex work um, is something that, you know, gets a lot of people kind of um, agitated, right? Um, so what I'm focusing on most notably for this phase of this research is the, the, the notion of adult consent, okay? So, my research question number one, and actually, I want to ask this of all of you. Okay, so get ready to chat amongst yourselves for another two minutes. So, question, does consensual adult activities related to sex tourism, or sex work more broadly, in a location where sex work is decriminalized, as in the case with Costa Rica, 
lead to more or less human trafficking, particularly of minor children. Meaning, if sex work is allowed, legalized, regulated, and safe, can that exacerbate other types of forced sexual activity, or can it lessen it because it's more freely available and safe and open? Okay, two minutes. Vote yes or no. What do y'all think? Increase or decrease trafficking? Yes. I don't really think it would do either or because it would really depend on like the societal views at that time. Not only that, but like will people actually want to pursue it just because it's safe? Okay, excellent answer. Okay, so neither exacerbate, increase, or decrease. Okay, a couple people that I spoke to. I think it'll your thoughts, kind of decrease it because if you look at the people that are illegally doing sex work now, if you make it legalized, they have a market to go into which is going to reduce the demand of going out and capturing people to take those jobs. I thought it would increase because it would like normalize in that society so that I feel like less people would think of it as wrong if it's like too normalized. So it would just become like a norm. Okay. Other thoughts? Yes. If it weren't regulated super, and I know that's part of that normal thing that it would be regulated, but if it weren't regulated tightly enough, then it could in some cases lead to cases of trafficking flying under the radar because there's not any sort of, you know, eye looking out for that activity as inherently being criminal as it is right now. So there's more intervention now because every time it's seen, it's, it's addressed. But that isn't to say that it could not have a positive impact. Any other thoughts? Yes. I feel like it will um, increase the because, um, like, the same power that they use to give people arguments for either case. Um, so this is what um, what I'm really trying to focus on. Um, and each context, um, be it a local context, if we think about um, the tiny pockets of legalized sex work here in the US, right? Um, what county is it in Las Vegas or outside of Las Vegas? Um, there was an experiment in Rhode Island for a few years, um, and there's um, new possibilities of decriminalization efforts in, in other cities in the US. But for the most part, um, each, each uh, certainly each country is, is very specific. Now what's unique about Costa Rica is that while sex work, transaction, transactional sex, right, somebody gives a service, pays for the service, etc., is not illegal. There are some things that are illegal. Most notably, um, that, that key word, right, pimping or procurement of a sex, uh, a sex worker under the control of that coercive force and brothels and um, prostitute, like group prostitution gangs, essentially. So what I appreciate about the Costa Rican model, and there are other similar um, legal models like this in other parts of the world, is that it's it's criminalizing what I think is the worst aspect of this, which is the, the pending or the procurement, um, as opposed to the actual person who chooses to do this work for whatever reason, without force, that that is what is, is sanctioned and regulated to some extent and supported. So a couple of the ways um, that sex workers in Costa Rica receive support um, is they can get free health checks every 15 days. Um, they will have um, you know, 
know, support um, from their social security, their national social, social security system. And, um, and in return for that, they actually have to pay taxes, work, report their income, et cetera. So, um, so it, it kind of benefits the, the broader economics of the country, but more importantly, it creates a more safe um, um, environment for a person who chooses to do this work. Again, over 18. Now, under 18, the Costa Rican authorities are extremely strict about arresting people who are, are trafficking persons under 18. Um, or trying to be a client thereof. And there's um, pretty wide knowledge amongst the people who actually go down to Costa Rica for sex tourism about, you know, don't, don't go there, right, because you will be thrown in jail. Um, but there's another really interesting piece of legislation, let's see about time here, um, that I'll be talking about in a minute or two. Um, but first, um, one of my second key research questions is, um, what are people doing about the remaining problematic issues um, to do with trafficking? So even though Costa Rica is a very good place in terms of its legislative model, there still is some trafficking of minor children. Um, there's some labor trafficking. And um, so what I'm looking at is how do nonprofit organizations do something to try and help the situation? to try and support people who have been victims of trafficking, to try and encourage people to not be trafficked, um, to provide education and skill building um, for um, at-risk youth um, and women, but also men as well, but primarily uh, women and children, um, and also trying to raise awareness about the potential det detrimental impacts of sex work and sex tourism in places like Costa Rica. So this is uh, my big research question number two. And it's challenging. So for one thing, there are not many faith-based organizations or nonprofit organizations operating in Costa Rica. There could be more. Maybe there will be more over time. But as of now, um, it's really a handful. So, um, so when I am doing um, in-depth interviews or if I'm on site at, um, at a faith-based organization's office or in, um, in one case that I'll be showing you in a second, um, um, like uh, education centers or after-school programs, etc. cetera, uh, there just aren't that many. So, um, so my N, if, if you are a social or behavioral scientist, scientist you'll understand that the, the number of interviews are, are relatively small but will continue to grow. Um, and also, they're, um, they're not that easy to find. Some are, are um, officially housed in the U.S. and then kind of go down to Costa Rica at certain times of the year and try to do some work, et cetera, et cetera. So there, are, there, are, there have been occasions when people I'm hoping to meet with their interviewer are actually in Houston when I'm in Costa Rica, et cetera. So there are some challenges of that nature. Um, but what I found is that people really want to talk about the work they're doing, which I think is great. Um, what is very interesting is uh, several of these organizations would, I mean, they may not use the language, but I would tend to categorize them as evangelical Christian organizations. Um, they're a little bit um, hesitant to say where their funding comes from. They're a little bit, um, or perhaps not a little bit, um, open about the fact that they're really trying to get people to not engage in legalized sex work from a more of a morality standpoint and so forth. Um, so there are, you know, so there are various there are various issues and challenges. Um, but this issue of consent, and this this uh, relates to the question that we discussed a few moments ago. So we're going to skip that since we already addressed that. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of divergent views and debates about sex work, okay? So it's a very contested area. Um, amongst feminist scholars and um, activists and advocates, there are similar um, confl uh, conflicting views, either you know, sex work is no, no matter what the form or no matter how much one thinks one is choosing to do this work, they're still um, under the the um, broader rubric of patriarchal domination. Other feminists would say this is a free choice, and if somebody wants to do this, this is good. It should be done. So these these um, debates about free choice and agency have been going on for decades, and will continue to go on. 
Um, but it seems like, for the most part, most people of various viewpoints argue that the penalties, the legal penalties, should be reduced for people who are engaged in sex work. Again, not the pimps, but the people who are actually doing the sex work. And some argue, but you know, but in a, in a, another conflicting um, view is that some argue that legislation will create um, more or less security for sex workers. So um, the laws targeting those who pay for sex ultimately hurt sex workers because there are some legislative models. Um, one, one is um, known as the Nordic model that criminalizes um, what's known as Johns, you know, the people buying the sex. And sex workers say that, that while that's um, well intended to address the issue of demand, it actually has harmed sex workers' safety and um, ability to, to um, freely do the work they want to do. So it's extremely complex, um, and, and it, it, it varies in all kinds of places around the world. Okay, so I want to switch to why I kind of a different view of this whole sex work thing. And it started when I uh, when I was looking at the most dangerous jobs in the world. So what do you think the most dangerous jobs are? <coughs> yes. Mining. Mining. Okay. Thank you. Other ones? Construction. Construction. Yep. Military. Military. Yep. Okay. Yes? Uh, I think there's like, there's this job, I think in Nigeria they have a lot of e-waste, so like handling like electronic waste. Absolutely. Absolutely. So e-waste, electronic waste from all the <coughs> planned obsolescence, electronic gizmos that rich people in the West tend to use. What do we do when we're moving on to the iPhone 10 or 20 or whatever? It ends up in... Um, toxic um, landfills, essentially, um, most notably in various places in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's really, really deadly stuff. Okay, so anything to do with any kind of environmental toxins. Okay, anything else? Okay, so yes, all of those are extremely dangerous, and many researchers would say that um, sex work is far more dangerous. So I want to talk a little bit about mining. Ross for, for bringing this up. Um, so police officer, firefighter, coal miners, the American College of Immunology in 2012 have, have put three of these um, job categories at the top of the most dangerous, but sex work is even more dangerous. Uh, but it's the coal mining thing that really tugged at my heart, um, and I'll, I'll explain this in a second. Um, but my goal as a labor advocate and an economic uh, justice advocate is safety for all workers whatever job they choose to have. Um, so, mining. My grandfather was a coal miner. He immigrated from Hungary in 1914 in the steerage of a ship across the Atlantic. And remember the days before the internet? You probably don't. But um, people in the so-called old country actually thought that the streets were paved with gold in the US. That's what they were told. So he had really high hopes. And went through Ellis Island, and he started working with whatever job he could get, which at first was working on the railroads, and kind of made his way from Ellis Island down to Appalachia in uh, southeastern Ohio, and worked in the mines. Um, it was a crap job, right? Can't imagine what it would be like going down a mile into the earth. He had black lung, he had an amputated leg, from um, the various horrible work conditions. Um, but it was the best gig going in Appalachia in the 1920s, 30s, post-depression, et cetera. And when I think about how people will question, well, why don't you just get a better job, right? Why are you working in sex work? Why are you a prostitute? You know, I think about my grandfather. You know, had a crap job, horribly dangerous, depressing, god-awful job, but it was the best gig going, right? And that's not that different from people who engage in consensual sex work. It's the best paying, most flexible job that they could probably qualify for. 
And another thing about sex work with regard to trafficking and pimping, I don't know if, if some of you know about how coal miners were paid and other, other, um, other low entry level jobs kind of like that have been paid, not with real money, but instead with these things called scrip, which are basically fake money that you can go buy your food and, and various basic needs at a company store. This is actually the company store where my grandfather would shop from the Hannah Coal Company where he worked. And there's this famous song, I owe my soul to the company store. This is, um, this is a, a company house in the neighborhood where my grandfather lived and so forth. So not only was it a horribly dangerous job, but it was also one that was completely indebted to the people who owned the company and owned the mines. Not that different from trafficking, arguably. Okay. So um, one of the things that miners did in the US in the early part of the 20th century, in the late part of the 19th century, was formed um, labor unions. And one of the most important and lasting ones, the United um, Mine Workers of America, have done things that have benefited all of us from safety in the workplace to um, the eradication of child labor and so forth. So, um, so if we kind of transfer that mode of thinking of how do we make a crappy job as less crappy as possible, let's shift back to sex work. Okay, there are various very, very respected organizations um, from the World Health Organization, the United Nations, Amnesty International, The Lancet is a, a very well regarded British <coughs> medical journal, who all support decriminalization for sex work. So why do you think that they would why? why? Why would they do that? Why do you think? Yes. It's the safety of the workers. Let's speak up, please. To support the safety of the workers. Okay, support the safety of workers. Okay, good. What else? <coughs> think about legislation. All right, so to perhaps if respected organizations such as these are pushing for legislation that will criminalize the really nefarious aspects of this particular industry, in this case pimping and trafficking, it helps, you know, it helps people who, who choose to do this work. Okay? Um, if you also take note of UNAIDS, World Health Organization, there are clear um, reasons about um, health and safety. Right? Um, if we take the Costa Rican model of, and, and many other countries where there is limited or fully decriminalized sex work, there are, um, you know, health checks. Um, you have to prove that you are STD free at any point, etc. Okay, so there are various, um, you know, very respected organizations who are pushing for decriminalization again of consensual adult activity. Okay. So back to Costa Rica. So, sex tourism. Another thing that I had never heard of before going to Costa Rica was this phenomenon. Anyone heard of this? Sex tourism? I mean, there's all kinds of tourism now. Dental tourism, cosmetic surgery tourism, sex tourism, where people actually go to a location, usually where sex work is decriminalized, in order to have affordable paid sex, okay? so. Um, my own observation, so um, even though the, so I, I didn't really talk a lot about the methodology of my research, I'm happy to do so if we have time, um, but one of the things that I have done um, with the support of, of my, my male posse, because I wouldn't really go out into one of these places alone, is to, to go where these dudes hang out, okay? So this is kind of a typical sex tourist in Costa Rica. Um, who, who, in fact, you know, often lies about saying what he's doing in Costa Rica is on a fishing trip, whatever. Um, but instead, he is he is um, picking up affordable sex workers in a place like Taco Beach and elsewhere. So, um, what's interesting is that they're very chatty, chatty guys. I, I've learned a lot about their interests and motives and um, their their attitude, um, which is not um, often it's often kind of disturbing. Uh, but they're generally like your guy next door. So, um, but what do you think? Um, 
what else is involved with sex tourism? So, what would you think? Like some perceptions of sex tourism, anybody? Yes, sorry. I feel like it's informed by like uh, <coughs> Orientalism or like a justification of different races. Absolutely, absolutely. So there's, there's, um, and when, um, um, tell me your name. B. B? Yeah. When B, hi, I know we've met before. When B is talking about orientalizing and essentializing and otherizing, um, the, the, the term orientalism dates, um, is, is attributed to a scholar by the name of Edward Said who um, originally came up with this concept of Orientalism to <coughs> critique Western views, Western being US, Western Europe, et cetera, views of the Middle East primarily. And um, dating back to colonial days, um, the notion that the French or British or or um, Dutch colonists going into a place like um, anywhere in the Middle East or Africa would see citizens of those areas as would be said the other, meaning the exotic, the different, the potentially exploitable, the potentially expendable. And um, there has been a great deal of critique of sex tourism in terms of um, its racialized, gendered, and classed view of the people that these guys are going down to try and interact. Okay. So thank you. It's a very important concept um, to note. So this idea that there is a hierarchy. Remember I was talking about hierarchies way back in the beginning of this session about you know a relatively wealthy person, even though often that's not necessarily the case by US standards, right? We're a relatively wealthy person going down to a place like Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, and elsewhere, and feeling like a king. I mean, literally, like king of the mongers. And, um, and the, the, the arrogance of it all is, is that, as I said, it's quite unsettling. So um, we're going to keep going, and I'm going to tell you about a sex tourism, a celebrity sex tourist, actually. The Curious Case of Cuba Dave. OK, so here's another guy. White guy from Miami, originally from Minneapolis, who claims to have procured the services of at least 2,000 women in, or maybe, you know, some in multiple, you know, more than once, I don't know. Anyways, 2,000 women in uh, Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, and elsewhere in Central America. And, um, you see, I don't know if you can see what's on his shirt, cubadave.com. Okay. He had a website where he would ask the sex worker, either before or after services were rendered, can I take my picture with you? And that person gave, um, gave the allowance of, of taking the picture and putting the picture on the site. Um, and he had hundreds of pictures of himself with um, the various women in these countries and uh, essentially became like a local celebrity amongst sex tourists. He um, was traveling into the country in September 2015 and was stopped by the Costa Rican authorities and arrested. Unprecedented, un absolutely unprecedented. And he was the first person tried convicted, arrested, and um, held for nearly two years um, for uh, a relatively <coughs> new trafficking law from the Costa Rican government, Le Para Cometer de Trata Persona, the law to combat human trafficking, which had an article, I think it was B61, a little subcategory, that along with, remember what's legal and what's illegal, right? Pimping's illegal, brotheling is illegal, promoting sex tourism is now illegal under this 2013 law. And the authorities did not like how he was essentially promoting Costa Rica as a sex tourism destination. So you can see here's one of um, the people he came to know, cubadave.com. Um, there are like 278 pictures on his MySpace thing, which are still available, even though he took them down. Huh? 
Um, Cuba Dave, once he was arrested, all the pictures came down and it was an appeal to raise money to get him out of jail, etc., etc. Um, so he was used as essentially a scapegoat and a warning to other sex tourists, don't promote sex tourism, right? We're going to let it happen, the authorities will let it happen, but just shut up about it. He was a little too arrogant and a little too out there, and he um, ended up in this really, really intense prison. Uh, that was one of his prison mates with um, various large knives, um, and that's him being arrested. <coughs> so um, so it, it was a warning to other people coming to the country to just be a little more quiet about what you're doing. Okay? And one would guess that the Costa Rican authorities would hope that if there's an awareness of risk, like here's this Cuba Dave dude who's now in this horrible jail, maybe the incentive will decline and um, demand will decline. Okay, so that was one thing that I've written about um, and continue to track um, what Cuba Dave's doing. He was released this year um, and he's now back to being a celebrity, running the book, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, shifting ahead to one of the nonprofit organizations, the faith based organizations that I have spent time um, interviewing the director and um, meeting some of the, the youth who have been helped by the organization, etc., is called Seeds of Hope. And um, it was founded by um, a person in San Diego who was traveling in Costa Rica, perhaps not unlike how I have. And um, Penny, she was on this really interesting bridge where you can um, look down and see all these crocodiles, so, which I've done numerous times. Um, so she was standing there with a, uh, a young woman who was coming down to do some missionary work with her. And she overheard two guys talking about what they planned to do while they were in Costa Rica. And she was really unsettled by this because they were talking about um, you know, they were kind of raiding some of the women that they were, you know, seeking or had already um, experienced, etc. And she actually engaged in a dialogue with one of them and um, said, you know, what if this was your daughter, right? So, um, so that was an unsettling conversation for both parties. Um, hopefully, she thinks that maybe he had some new insights from that dialogue. Um, but it certainly helped her to understand that maybe this is something I need to be doing to try and raise awareness um, about the, de the potential detrimental impact of sex tourism of North America, primarily U.S. men, going to Costa Rica and um, buying sex. So this organization um, has set up several after-school programs. Um, six after-school clubhouses for young people aged 8 to 17. They operate um, these clubhouses in some of the poorest communities in the, in the province where I've been doing my field research, Punta Arenas. And um, this talks about, um, this is a long quote, I won't read it out to you, but um, it's basically one of the people who have participated in the after-school programs. Um, there's so much that God is doing through the lives of these kids, so evident their attitudes and evolving perspectives on life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually, no, this is a volunteer, so sorry. Um, so Seeds of Hope is providing a safe and positive place for kids to learn about themselves and our creator. And they do various things from um, learning how to grow and harvest medicinal herbs to art projects to dance. Um, and they, they earn they earn the opportunity to go on weekend trips, to go surfing, and so forth. Um, one of their key um, their key activities is Bible study. Um, you know, it's it's so some people, uh, <coughs> arguably like me, think it's a little too God focused, um, but they're doing good in the community, and so I, I do commend them for that. Um, this is um, an image of some field study. Um, this is some of the medicinal herb activity and in the center as a volunteer. Um, this is one of the um, one of the, the after school programs in Parita, which is a really interesting um, village in Potorinas province that um, arguably is is certainly more uh, more impoverished than other places in the province. Okay, 
Okay, um, so in the interest of time, so I want to have um, plenty of time to take questions and have more dialogue. Um, I want to share with you some current um, legislation. So, um, who knows about Backpage? What do you know about Backpage? Okay, so it's kind of like Craigslist, um, but it has been the most um, active place to promote and um, acquire the services of sex workers in the U.S. Um, and, and Craigslist has that capacity as well, but Backpage is a, is a whole other lecture in and of itself because um, they've been um, sued for actually prom uh, promoting underage sex trafficking. It's been really, really um, challenging. And as a result, their parent company, um, the Village Voice of New York City, is shut down, arguably in, re in reaction to the, to the, the lawsuit. Whatever the case, um, as a reaction to things like Backpage, the U.S. government has put forth legisl um, proposed legislation, FOSTA, um, which stands for a Federal Order of um, Sex Trafficking Ad uh, Advocacy, so it's to um, mitigate sex trafficking. SESTA is the, the U.K. equivalent. So these are protests that have just happened in May of this year. Um, Sex workers argue that this type of legislation, which is to do things like shut down um, online spaces like Backpage and Craigslist, they actually hurts consensual sex workers. So this um, is another part of the challenge that I've had to track current legislation and reactions to it. So I want to um, finish the formal part of the presentation with some ideas about what we can do. And going back to this need for literacy, the need for awareness, um, there's so much information out there, it's absolutely overwhelming, and, and in a good way. There's a lot that we can learn. Um, some of it's back on the info table, others I'm happy to share with you if you contact me. Um, the various units at the federal, state, local levels, in this case the U.S. Department of Education's Technical Assistance Center for the Federal Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program is one um, body that's central to help identify at-risk youth. And this is particularly important because research shows that persons who are in the foster care system are far more likely to end up being trafficked. Why do you think that would be? So in the US foster care system. And think back to the recruiters, right? I never had a birthday cake, etc. So kids are vulnerable and then we would do foster houses that are moving around a lot a bunch of places. Right, absolutely. Right. So so very um, you know an increased amount of movement. Um, and perhaps great displeasure, right? Um, so more, much more likely to run away. Okay. So, um, so that's one of the one of the key foci of the um, Department of Ed's program in this case. Um, the other thing to um, be attentive to is the impact of globalization. I talked about this very early in the presentation, right? It's much more easy to move around. Okay. Charles de Gaulle, that's a major Paris airport right there. Okay. Um, increased ability to move around, increased ability to communicate online with um, who knows what, with what kind of strangers. Okay. So this is something that I hope to continue to track. And also, um, specific to Costa Rica, many sex workers, consensual sex workers, and also trafficked um, people in um, the sex trade who are forced into it are migrating from places like um, Guatemala um, and other, other um, surrounding um, nations, especially Nicaragua, ones that are far less economically stable. So the issue of globalization is relevant to my particular research site as well. Okay. Um, I want to return to this notion of decreasing incentive and how we can do that. Okay, um, the 
Office for Victims of Crime Training and Technical Assistance Center, which is a, a bureau under uh, the Office of Justice Programs of the U.S. Department of Justice, says a strong multidisciplinary task force that utilizes talents from all sectors can add to the momentum of decreasing the incentive um, for perpetrators to commit the crime. So I think, again, to help awareness, to increase risk for the perpetrators, and hopefully decrease incentive and decrease trafficking. Okay, so I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna end up with a few things about what we can do, but I wanna hear from you first before I share my thoughts. So, what can we do as one person in our community to, to try and reduce human trafficking? What can we do? Wanna talk amongst yourselves for a minute first? Come up with some strategies. Okay, two minutes. Okay, what can you do as an individual? What can your community do? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So education is key. Skill building, skill training is key. Good. What else? children aware of like the signs of people trying to coerce the military trafficking. Yeah, absolutely, right? This whole boyfriending phenomenon is really disturbing to me. Okay? How do we get young people to understand to, to not trust others? And, and that's horrible, right? We want to be trusting human beings, but how do we um, trust but in a, in a less vulnerable way? Okay? Um, apps like Tinder, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you were trying to be one of those recruiters, I think your go-to thing would be make, make a Tinder account and have a good profile. Yeah, right? Absolutely. That's, absolutely. Right? Yes. Yeah, kind of piggyback on him, it's kind of misunderstood your question as far as what we can do as far as helping the populace, but I think it's more we need to help our own selves as far as limiting social media. You have a phone, any device that has GPS, and you're not aware of the possibilities of technology. I mean, even me, just because I have training with the military, I have seen your faces. I can find you on Facebook. It's that easy. <laughs> not to freak right. anybody out. <laughs> right. but, but that's a really good example, right? To understand that if someone wants to track us down, We've made ourselves vulnerable by being on Facebook and and having smartphones, right? Which are smart for some people, but you know, kind of dumb for those of us who don't want to be tracked. Okay, so thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay. And think about um, peer peer to peer mentoring. So. I'm an old person, I'm super old, I'm clunky with this, blah, you know, I, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. But, you know, my daughter, when she was, when's, when's the first time you've had a, a, a smartphone? I was 12. 12. Okay, so when you were 12, Daniela and others, could you have gotten a sense that maybe one of the people with whom you were communicating, a school friend or whatever, was depressed or in kind of a potentially dodgy relationship. I mean, us oldster parents would be far less in tune to that, right? So how can young people be attentive and potentially helpful to others? Okay, all right, so, um, so a few other things. So what can you do? Um, identify people that may be at risk. There's a, a, a very um, well-researched and evidence-rich um, evidence body of work that suggests that people who are depressed are more likely to be potential victims, not only of trafficking, but victims of all kinds of things, right? Um, persons who have um, survived childhood sexual abuse are very much at risk, right? So, you know, if you get a sense of someone, you know, maybe not, you know, communicating online, oh, I look really ugly today, whatever. I mean, those are the kind of posts that the traffickers are looking for, right? They're, they're finding ways that young people articulate their vulnerability, 
that they're not feeling very good about themselves, etc. And then somebody's going to come in and start boyfriending or girlfriending to make them feel better. Okay. Um, I love these images, although I mean they break my heart. You know, when you ask someone how are you feeling, what are they? You know, more likely than not they're going to respond fine. But Look at all these words, which you probably can't see in the back, so I'll read them off. Confused, betrayed, useless, broken, never good enough, fragile, anxious, I'm, I'm falling apart and you don't notice it, rejected, lonely, lonely, defeated, pathetic, annoying, right? How do we get past fine and really sense if someone is needing support, is needing a friend? Learn about economic injustice. 70% of the world's poor are women, okay? Right, I talked about that at the beginning of, the, of the, the session, I come back to that. And what can we do about economic justice? Right. What can we really do? What's possible? companies that appropriately compensate their workers. Sometimes that's difficult to figure out, right? But at least we can try, right? Um, if we would hire someone, be it a babysitter or someone to cut your grass, you know, why not pay them twice minimum wage? Why not? Most likely we can all do that, right? So, so little things that perhaps aren't so little, okay? Be an informed citizen. Vote for people and policies that support economic justice. Um, another faith-based organization that um, I've uh, come to know, I haven't um, engaged in any direct interviews yet, I hope to, is um, the Catholic Sisters Against Trafficking. And they, um, before the midterms, um, I'm losing my notes here, but, um, but I can, if anyone wants to find out more about this, um, just follow up with me. That they actually put forth um, a voter's guide. So if people were going to a debate for candidates, they had a list of questions to say, I, I want to know what your policies are about um, how, um, what support you might give to a company if they are not transparent about their supply chain and where, um, who's doing their work, etc. cetera. So, um, so again, if anyone wants that, I can send that to you, okay? Um, I mentioned stuff we buy, make informed decisions, learn about the companies. We were talking about Nike over here.